Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Peter Clausey of CBLT Inc. How are you today, Peter? I'm very well, Tracy. How are you? Well, I'll tell you, how does it feel to be a junior that's actually making money? Can you tell our shareholders and tell your shareholders and investors out there a little bit more about what you're doing right now? Sure. As we all know, it's a difficult mining market out there. Uh, there are many companies whose values aren't reflected in their share price. So you can either sit around and whine about it, or you can do something about it. My board told me to do something about it. We bought non-core assets, packaged them, went to Australia, met with anybody who'd meet with us, and was able to sell these assets to create a profit for CBLT back in Canada. In essence, we did a hard dollar, million dollar financing without any fees on top. Well, while you were in Australia, we had a couple of investors in town this last week. They're telling me that uh, Australia is experiencing a gold rush and they're redirecting their attention towards the resource sector. Is this, yes. uh, is this correct? Is this consistent with your own conclusions, having just gotten back from Australia? Well, uh, Australia doesn't have the same kind of risk capital market that Canada or the United States has. They don't have a cannabis market. They don't have a crypto market. So the risk capital has stayed in junior high tech, junior mining, junior oil and gas. It hasn't fragmented. So there's more capital available. But yes, there have been a couple of recent discoveries in the gold sector that have juiced the market generally. Plus the rebirth of rare earths and lithium, we'll call it 2.5 because we're not quite at lithium 3.0 yet, uh, has also helped to excite the market. Uh, George and his buddies at Northern have done a really good job of bringing that project to market. They were a big hit when they were traveling in New York, and it's helped to re-excite the rare earths market. Peter, i got to tell you, I don't know if you've seen how NEO's stock has moved. Uh, there's a lot of interest in electric cars, as you know. We don't have the cobalt that we need, so I don't understand why people aren't lined up around the block to have your conflict-free mineral source, source of uh, cobalt here in Canada uh, what's going on there? What, what's the disconnect between the cobalt demand, as we know there's a real shortage, and, you know, uh, the interest in CBLT, for instance? Well, there are a lot of reasons for it. It's a market that still lacks credibility. You know, there's a group in Australia that reports in cobalt equivalent by taking a little bit of copper and a little bit of gold and a little bit of silver and doing some magic and in increasing their cobalt number. Things like that hurt all of us, and I wish they'd stop doing it. The other problem we have is cobalt is a bizarre metal. It's only found in a few places around the globe in, in mineable quantities. 60% of it comes from the Congo. So anything that happens in the Congo affects uh, cobalt globally. The other funny thing is physics. If that battery were called a, a cobalt ion battery, I believe cobalt would be flying out the door. But it's a mere trick of physics that that ion, the electron travels back and forth through the lithium, and that's why we call it a lithium-ion battery. There's 12 times more cobalt than lithium in your standard lithium-ion battery. So in the battery, uh, Peter, I was interviewing a couple of other uh, cobalt uh, CEOs, and they were telling me that the real demand in the bath battery is for the cathodes. Is that correct? Yes, the cobalt's in the cathode, not in the anode. And they were also explaining to me that the cobalt that's actually needed is not the metal, but the cobalt sulfate. Is that correct? It's a processed form of the cobalt, which typically trades at about a 30% premium over the price of the base metal itself. So in the situation with CBLT, let's talk, for instance, you just put out uh, an update on Bloom Lake. Um, do you have the capacity to, to produce cobalt sulfate from that particular property? Well, we sold that to uh, a group in Australia called Winmar Resources, but we're managing their field and exploration program for them. It's too soon to tell, but as you saw from the last set of results, Bloom Lake is a wonderful property, and we own 16 million shares in Winmar, so we're very happy with our position there. So, you know, as a project uh, propagator, Peter, with CBLT, for cobalt. Can you tell me a little bit more about some of your other uh, projects that you currently uh, are working with? For instance, uh, I think I saw a news release on your Chilton project in Quebec. Right. 
We've been uh, very successful at Chilton so far. It's about an hour north of Montreal in the Granville sub-province. Um, we're in there right now getting permits to do excavation and a drill program later this fall, early winter. We have nickel, copper, cobalt, and chromium in the soils. And the press release that you're referring to uh, confirms that those three groups of scientific data confirm each other, that the IP and the mag and the ground truthing all intersect so we know where to go excavate for the best chances in the drill program. It's a very exciting program, and I'm looking forward to seeing the results from that. Uh, Peter, your, your company has had an ongoing news flow that's been impressive competitive with many of the juniors that are out there. You're, you're putting out milestones. They sound sensible to me. I mean, uh, the one previous to the Chilton Cobalt news release, you know, CBLT trades two non-core cobalt assets for cash and equity interest, the, the deal that you were talking about uh, earlier in this discussion. Can you tell yep. us what we should expect, say, in the next quarter or two from you? Well, on our balance sheet, we are carrying shares in two companies that aren't listed yet. We expect both of those to be listed this quarter. One on the Canadian Stock Exchange, one on the Australian Stock Exchange. Between those two, we're looking at roughly $230,000 of value that can be liberated once they're listed. We have our 16 million shares of Winmark, which is worth about $420,000. We have $85,000 worth of Krakatoa stock and roughly $15,000 worth of Krakatoa tradable options. We also have our own core projects upon which we're working. So our plan is twofold. Continue with aggressive M&A. Buy cheap, work it, sell it if you can make a profit, and work your core assets. We're in the field of Copper Prince, which is our gold, cobalt, copper project in Sudbury, Ontario. I mentioned that we're working at Chilton in uh, Quebec. We're also sending a team into our British Columbia project, and this might be news to you. We have a beautiful asset in southern BC, near Peachland. Problem has been it's heavily forested. So the recent forest fires that wiped out part of that section is horrible for people. Nice mug. Horrible for people. Horrible for animals. But the prospectors and the geologists love a good forest fire because it opens up areas. We're sending in a team to do a 2,000 sample soil program uh, in that property called McHale BC. There's strong historic evidence of gold, silver, molly, copper. Well, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. We love your updates. And uh, let's try and get you on Investor Intel once a month. How does that sound? That sounds good for me. I always enjoy being here. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.